Okay, so uh, my next question is about Muhammad. You might have heard of him. Uh, he's mentioned in the Quran. Uh, so, right, uh, taking in, into consideration the fact that even the Quran says that he has sinned and will be forgiven for future sins and is therefore not perfect, um, do you believe that his revelations are the result of uh, mental illness, um, habitual lying, or do you think there's a spiritual element in that he, I don't say is, was possessed, but was, do you believe that the Jibril that appeared to him in the cave uh, was actually some sort of demonic spirit? Okay, I'm not gonna help you too much with this answer, unfortunately, because you, okay. uh, you're, you're starting from the presupposition that Muhammad is the one that was given this book, that was, it was revealed to him between 610 and 632. That is, and that is the classical account. So you're reflecting what you heard, you're reflecting what you've been taught. In fact, you're reflecting what everybody has been taught. And anybody who's watching this would agree with you uh, that, every, that all the Muslims believe that Muhammad was revealed this book be, between those years, those 22 years. Um, I've got this book right here. Take a look at the title. That was one of a question I was going to ask you actually, and I'm not joking, but that's no, brilliant. I like that it's, author's. Yeah, I like a him. Great job here, and if you have a chance to read this book, it is packed with material, with evidence, and what he is doing, he's asking a very important question. It's the same question that was asked of Jesus Christ, and it's yes, the it still same. is. And still is. And we should do that with anybody that claims to be a prophet or anybody that claims to be God. Anytime you have a revelation like these two revelations here, and they, yeah. and they make historical claims. Every, both these books make historical claims. Whenever you have a historical claim that there was a man who existed at a certain time and did certain things at a certain place, you've got to invest it historically. Because that's names, yeah. places, and events. You've got to use those four criteria to then investigate it. Now, Muslims have not done that. They've just assumed everything that this book says about this man, Muhammad, is correct. But this book doesn't talk much about Muhammad. In fact, his name is only found four times in the Quran. Yeah, there's... Much three. less than Isa. Yeah. Oh, it's found over three, uh, uh, 93 times formally and many more informally. So Isa and almost every other character is found more than Muhammad. What's fascinating to me then, who is this prophet that this book always talks about? It does refer to a prophet. It does refer to this representative of God. It refers over and over again to the place where this prophet lived. Only once does it mention it, that it's Mecca. That's in chapter 48, uh, verse 24. So you can see in almost every case, there is a there is a... Um, well, <laughs> there is a vacuum that exists, both in this book concerning this man, Muhammad. Did, but well, let's put it one step back. And to answer your question, let's don't just say, did, was Muhammad deluded or was Muhammad possessed or did Muhammad just lie or was he just borrowing? Let's say the author of the Quran. Yes. Okay? Let's do that. Then, then we can both be talking on the same plane. Because when yeah. you look at the author of this book, you can see there, there's an enormous amount of problems uh, because certainly, the first of all, there's only one story that's complete in this book, which suggests to me that it was put together rather hurriedly. It does not flow. There is no chronology. It jumps all over the place. It's ulta pulta, as we I say. I think it's by chapter length. That's how it's organized within the exactly. book. It's by length of chapter, but even within the chapters, the stories don't flow. Yeah. Even within the chapters, they don't even have the same themes. They jump all over the place with different themes, and it confuses. Stories don't begin and stories don't end, which suggests that who, that whoever put this book together borrowed a little bit here, borrowed a little bit there, borrowed all over the place, and we can see exactly where they borrowed. Take, take for example, all the stories concerning the, the prophets. Now, there are 25 prophets listed. Four of them are names we don't know. Two of them are Ishmael and Muhammad, and the other 19 are all in the line of Isaac. Isn't that interesting? So the vast majority of the prophets in this book are from the li line of Isaac, uh, through, uh, via a Abraham through Isaac, which when you look at them, however, they're not the same stories as in this book. Completely different stories, fantastic stories. You have, song, uh, you have Solomon you know, there in chapter 27 who is talking to hooper birds and marching birds, getting them ready for battle. So where did Solomon, where was he able to talk to hooper birds? Sending him down to bring this queen up from Sheba. And then when she comes across, she 
Josh, when she comes up from Sheba, having had this conversation with the purple bird, which means she talks to birds as well. I had no idea that in 1900 BC people could talk to birds. We must have lost that ability. But nonetheless, this story is fantastic in nature, and the reason was very simple. It comes from the second Targ Targum of Esther, which is an apocryphal account written in the second century yeah. AD. It was borrowed, that lifted right out of that. That's a Jewish apocryphal account. No Jew would ever consider that to be authoritative. The Jews knew it. It was nothing more than a fairy tale for children to read at bedtime. Yeah. Yet there it is in chapter 27, verse 17 to 44. You can see all of these are borrowed. And because they were borrowed, you can then understand that they, did, they borrowed the wrong material because they didn't go to the authoritative text to find out about these stories. And this book had yet to be translated into Arabic. It was not translated into Arabic until the late 8th century. This book was written probably in the beginning, probably the be end of the 7th century, the beginning of the 8th century, not at the time of Uthman. We can't, we can't find one manuscript that comes from Uthman at all. So take, throw that out the window. Which means if you're borrowing from right, left, and center, you could, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And that's why there yeah. are so many historical mistakes in this book. I don't have time to go through the whole litany of them. Uh, we're doing, on um, Fander Film, I'm doing a whole series with Al Fadi. We've done already one looking at the historical problems. I'm now doing a whole series right now. Uh, I've kind of waylaid it a bit because of all this problem, all these new things I found on the coins. But there's looking at, just looking at the Quran internally not looking at it externally, looking and seeing what it says and confronting it. And boy, oh boy, are we having a great time. It is just mm. so full of inadequacies, so many errors, so many contradictions, so many historical anachronisms, so many scientific errors, full of them, enormous amount of them. And so- Do you mean, the sci sorry, Jay, do you mean the scientific miracles? I think I misheard you. I thought you every, said errors. Every one of the scientific miracles turns into an error. Wait till you see what we've come up with that. That's okay. a whole other area that I have I yet to wait. produce on Fander Films. But Al Fadi and I did that. We actually did, and he just put it up on his Sira International. If you can go see it right now, I think there's. Yeah, I, I put his channel on my list. Oh, look at it. There's about 17 yeah. miracles that they claim are miracles that we've shown are not miracles whatsoever. They're, they're either in error or they're just observable by the naked eye. There's no yeah. miracle about them. But the ones that are in error are the real devastating ones. Because if this was from God, why would he make error after error after error? God would not make those kind of errors. See if you as far can as I know, he doesn't make mistakes. See if you can find any scientific er errors in this book. Ooh, I love that. See if you can find any historical anachronisms in this book. Ooh, I love that. So we're doing like with like. And this is what you have to do. When you ask a question, what do we do about... Muhammad, the author of that book, should we say that he is uh, the author of this book? I wouldn't, yes, he probably is, probably has demon. Uh, there are certainly a lot of things that suggest that there is spiritual battle. There are some spiritual inadequacies in here. And what I would say is that we've got the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And in almost every case, if that is the situation, then can you understand why this book is so hopeless? Why I make sure my Quran is always smaller than my Bible? This is the bigger, the better book for a reason. I keep it. Not only theologically, you mean physically as well. <laughs> and visually, so you can see which is better. Good question. Thanks, Thanks very much.